How's it going, guys? It is Glick here from the Evidentries and the Sanctuary. Um, it's been a long time since I have been able to record a, another chapter for Shadows Before Dawn. I'm actually kind of disappointed in the lack of time that I've had lately to do recordings. Um, I was all set and ready to do one, uh, to record earlier today, actually, and um, got my camera set up only to realize, hey, my battery's low and I don't have any other batteries at the moment that have charges. So my battery, uh, my batteries for my camera is charging right now. And, um, yeah, we're back to, <laughs> we're back to the room recording. So, uh, regardless, I think I have a little bit of time left and, uh, until people start coming back and it gets a little noisy around the house again. Um, so I'm going to try and knock out chapter five, uh, real quick. Um, see so yeah, we're on chapter five today. So I'm actually going to start that right now. So yeah, um, at this rate, I'm, I'm still not really sure if, uh, at this point we'll be able to finish the entire thing by the end of September. I think it's possible if I keep on this, uh, if I keep on this three a week, well, yeah, even at three a week, I don't think, um, I don't think it's likely yeah, even, even at three a week, I think finishing this by the end of September is, is just not going to happen. So either I pick up the pace a little bit and uh, start pushing these out every free day I have available during the week, or, um, or we just let this rock into October, which I'm fine either way. I don't really feel like rushing things, um, but I guess, I'll, I guess I'll see how I feel once we uh, move into, you know, the sort of daily practices and lessons and teachings side of the book rather than uh i still feel like we're kind of in like a backstory uh part of it though i'm not really sure like how much it actually changes later on i don't know i haven't i haven't read this before so um yeah it'll be interesting to see how things play out but for now um i think i'll just remain on but we'll see what happens but as of now i think uh i'll, I'll keep doing the three a week and i think we're gonna have to try and stick with that um, as much as possible. Whew, I really wish I could have recorded downstairs today. It's it's a lot warmer here, so it's kind of hot, actually. Anyway, so we're on chapter five. Uh, Synchronicity is the title. So chapter five, section one. A point. Uh, chapter five, synchronicity, section one. A point of life transition. Within a year of my actual escape from Doc, I was free of him, but not from the demons that continued to haunt me. One, inv one event in particular and the emotions related to it is seared into my consciousness. It happened when I was 18. I had a panic attack while I was driving with Doc to the Amtrak train station in Salt Lake City. He pulled over to the side of the road and took out a spoon, positioned a brown tar heroin rock on the spoon, added some water, and heated it over his lighter flame. He sucked the hot liquid into a syringe, removed the air from it, and sunk it into my arm, pulling back on the plunger to make sure he had hit a vein. This time he injected the liquid while it was still too hot, so it sting the vein, uh, so, sorry, so it singed the vein as it climbed its way, like, as it climbed its way like a thousand beetles up my arm and my neck and into my brain. Jeez, I collapsed. I collapsed into the calm, oppressive safety of heroin of the heroin high, and after some time driving, he dropped me off at the train station. I had two hours until my train would arrive. I sat on the dirty floor in the corner of the train station with my sweater hood pulled up, feeling my arm burn and staring at the homeless people wandering through. Some of them were trying to find a Greyhound bus station, others were sleeping on benches, and still others set up cardboard signs with messages that said things like, Disabled vet, please help, God bless. Even though I had sunk deep into a hole within myself by the effect of the drug, I was able to feel the disappointment for the turn my life had taken. So this is where I am, I thought to myself. I had reached rock bottom. But fast forward to 2011, and I finally began to feel that my life had more than turned around. I had enjoyed the experience of being a professional athlete. I was living the life of an organic health advocate. I had a husband, and our son was two years old. At that time, I was seeing private clients for one-on-one -on -one sessions as a medical intuitive and spiritual guide. One day, I was driving down Highway 400 
uh, south in Salt Lake City and dropped and stopped at a light. To my right, I saw a uh, dis- disheveled, disheveled uh, looking man digging through a trash can. Since that day in the train station, every time I see homeless people, I feel as if I'm watching a parallel, a life parallel to my own. Many people feel a wide degree of separation between themselves and society's untouchables, but I feel that there is only a gap about the about the width of a hair that separates the life that I am living now from the life that they are living. Only a handful of circumstances that panned out differently. As I watched this man rifle through the garbage, I thought, that could be me. That might still be me, given a few more misfortunes. Ooh, okay. Section number two, The Sculptor in the Sky. This is actually the title of her first book. As I pulled the car away that day, uh, a desire was born within me, the desire to reach a larger audience with my message. I didn't just want to teach individual clients. I wanted to teach the world. And I had to find a way to make life improvement knowledge accessible to those who couldn't afford a personal session. With that passion burning within me, I sat down that night and began my first book. I think that all authors write books ultimately for themselves, which is what makes the process of writing a book so innately self-loving. It's as if I sat down with the pen and paper with my past self in mind, the self that was sitting in the train station high on a forced injection of heroin. I kept thinking, what would I want to tell that 18-year-old girl about the world? What would I tell her about life that might change her perspective enough about this universe that she could begin to improve her situation? Within three months, I had written my first book, The Sculptor in the Sky, which is about the universe, how it works, why happiness is important to the universe at large, and how to find happiness. That same year, I held my very first synchronization workshop. 20 people attended. People started writing articles about me for small peri- uh, periodic peri- periodicals periodicals i guess it's, i've never heard that before uh some of the articles were flattering others were libelous and left me under the covers of my bed crying but within a very short amount of time i start i developed a following every time i would ask myself what would someone love themselves do i was directed to another interview another article another guided meditation another workshop and as a result my career took off i began an online series of youtube on youtube called ask teal every saturday i selected a i selected a question or a subject from the thousands of submissions that i get and i answer the question and talk about my perspective on the subject in video format in the first year, the series gained millions of views. I also started painting energy. I also started painting energy on canvas, and I called these art pieces frequency paintings. Because of the extrasensory abilities that I came into this life with, I am able to perceive the energetic vibrational reality that makes up the physical world you see around you. My frequency paintings represent the energetic vibration frequency or whatever that specific subject matter is that I decide to paint. I created paintings because I knew that by focusing on these frequencies and having them in their living space, people's energy would start to entrain with them and resonate with. The same energy and amplitude of the vibrations I drew, (coughs) which would in turn help them amplify and manifest the presence of the subject matter into their lives. I have since created more than a hundred of these paintings, and they are now part of a frequency billboard campaign. This campaign is designed to use these frequencies to positively impact the collective consciousness. Uh, The collective conscious, sorry. We select populated areas that have an overall low vibration and that many people pass by on their commute, knowing that these frequencies will work in their select areas like a giant homeopathic remedy for the human race, positively affecting anyone who shares a space with them or observes them. And her frequency paintings are actually really good. I don't own any myself, but uh, they're actually awesome to look at. A glimpse, uh, section three, right? Or I'm not going to go by section numbers. New section, a glimpse of reality. I also started a blog where I let people into the pleasure and pain of my own day-to-day experience. 
I think that it's time that the world does away with the vision of the enlightened guru. To see a teacher as greater than yourself and to believe that he or she exists in a state of enlightened bliss, unaffected by the world, only works against you because it separates you from your own divinity. Spirituality is less accessible to those who don't see their spiritual teachers as people just like them. I started my blog to break down the separation between myself and those who follow my work. I feel that will bring them closer to their own divinity. For years, the common con uh, consensus was that authentic, <laughs> why can I not speak today? Authentic, <laughs> oh my God, I can't speak today. Authenticity meant career suicide for a sp spiritual teacher. It was thought that to expose your shadows to your students was to be seen as a flawed and defective, was to be seen as flawed and defective. And no one wants to follow a teacher with flaws. I'm now challenging the sacred belief. I am exposing the truth of myself to the world by offering the world emotional transparency. I feel that it's not right to ask people to expose their deepest, darkest fears, grief, and struggles to me without offering them the same in return. In fact, I showed up at my first intent international workshop in London, England, and looked out into the audience of more than 400. I was shocked. I had no idea. At that point, the impact that I made on people's lives at home, I feel like a nutty professor tinkering around with my theories and processes. <laughs> I don't feel like an icon of spiritual truth. Yet suddenly, here, I was being embraced by men and women in tears because they felt like my material changed their lives. Sitting in the hotel room after that first overseas workshop, I kept thinking, this is so much bigger than me. The big picture of my life began to make sense, like a first edition puzzle that had no pictures on the box. For years, my life gave no clue about what it was at all adding up to. Still one piece fit into another piece until the picture of my life made sense. The overall path was not a pretty one. I came into this life bent in the direction of torture and hell. I was the very definition of a victim, but my choice was to either die or commit to life completely. I chose life. I pieced the bent and broken shards of my life together to make a new life. I walked out of hell, and I made and I left breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs along the way so I could show other people how to do it, too. And here they were, listening. Here they were doing it. Now I realized I couldn't stop doing this job if I tried. Looking back and reading the journals I wrote when I was young, it's obvious that writing, speaking, and giving rise to philosophies about life is something that I have always done. It is a second nature. My purpose fell on my lap, like it always does, as if there was never any other way that my life could have gone. Now I have given birth to a new dream, a company called Headway, aimed at positive world change. Imagine a company that invests only in new ideas that genuinely benefit the world we live in. Now imagine that money accrued by this company doesn't go into the pocket of wealthy CEOs, but is instead rolled into another enlightened investment and then another. These ideas would come to fruition, and the company would gain strength and resources enough to affect government and policy. Headway will be involved in creating positive change in numerous areas, such as education reform, prison reform, and food industry reform. Some people call my vision lofty, but then I remind them that I am no stranger to beating the odds. I believe that the odds are not stacked against me as people would believe. I believe that people all around the world are ready for lasting change and that people truly want to see each other happy. I have come face to face with the uh, leprous ugliness of human nature, only to find that people are innately good. Oh, okay. New section. Bringing synchronization to life. <clears throat> Let's see what time is. Okay. Hundreds of people file into their chairs the hour before one of my synchronization workshop begins. Sitting in the green room, sometimes I could hear the murmur of their voices. I listen to music to get myself into the mood for the group extra. Uh, I was going to say group exercise. That's usually what they're called, but for the group experience. 
I work out my pre-show jitters with trauma release exercise. I greet my security team. When the time comes to step on stage, I make my way backstage through boxes, props, and lighting equipment and stand behind the curtain while my microphone is being fitted. Through the crack of the curtain, I could see the faces of the crowd. I can hear the heavy sound of the introduction that calls me onto center stage. I sit down in one of the two chairs that are positioned on stage. The spotlights are bright, and they make the room appear to glitter, bathing me in a surreal warmth that I have come to love. Looking out across the crowd, I can see their energy fields diffusing into one another. I can see the patterns appear in their auras as they react to me. The most dominant patterns in a person's energy field stand out to me as, cl as clear as day. Whenever I visit a new city, the people there want to know two things. The people there want to know two things. Okay, so, so that is what I usually start my session with. They want to know what the strongest collective positive vibration of the city is and what the most prevalent negative vibration is. In the same way that a food critic critiques food, I have become well respected as an energy critic. For example, if I visit a town like Boston, where people adhere to the philosophy, mind your own business, I often see the pattern of loneliness in the energy there. With loneliness, the aura field folds in on itself, not allowing itself to merge with anything on the outside. This is what I call a containment within the energy field. I skip a page? I hope not. Oh. All cities have their own vibe. A few months ago, I found myself feeling a bit nervous right before the most recent synchronization workshop in Los Angeles. In general, people who attend these workshops are so conscious and connected to others that they have unlimited invest or that they have unlimited interest in and patience for processing and healing. But in a town like LA, where entertainment moves at such a fast pace, you can hardly keep up with it. I was worried that some people might come to the workshop looking for entertainment or a show and thus be disappointed with the pace of true healing as it happens on the stage. Also, I was pretty sure that the people in the group who loved LA would not be happy with my energetic assessment of their city. I would have loved to give them a glowing report, but the reality is that those of us who are highly sensitive to the energy fields around us actually dread going there. I personally find that it is one of the hardest cities in the nation to be in because on an energetic va on, on an energetic level, it is like a vacuum vortex. The dominant negative vibration in LA is poisonous and uh, is is poisonous ambition, which makes it one of the most cutthroat cities in the world. But interestingly enough, the dominant positive vibration is ambition which is ironically the positive flip side of poisonous ambition. New section, a, synchronous, a synchronistic group experience. As I look out into the crowd at, my, at any of my workshops, I can see the vibrations that the participants share, both positive and negative. I then decide what I'm going to teach about based on what I see. I choose the dominant negative vibration that people are collectively holding as a theme for the day. I do this for a very good reason. The positive vibrations that people hold are already working for them, so I don't need to focus on those. Instead, they come to me seeking help for what troubles them, for what isn't working. And I could see it in the collective energy fields in the room. So for example, if I see that the collective vibration that people are struggling with is loneliness, I open by talking about loneliness, togetherness, and openness. Reading the energy and choosing an overall theme are both exciting and nerve-wracking because I cannot prepare for my own events. I don't know what I will teach about until the minute I am sitting in front of my audience. I don't know what questions I will be asked until they are asked live in front of everyone. Talk about being put on the spot. But it is also how the greatest healing occurs. For people to take part in the same experience within re, uh, rehabil re reality, sorry, they have to be a vibrational match. This means that they have uh, this means that they have to have enough in common to be drawn together in that specific place and time. This is the grand scale synchronicity, and this is and it's why every synchronization workshop that I host is unique and is a creation in and of itself. People often fly from countries around the world to attend, and no matter how far apart they live from one another or what language they speak, one thing is sure. If they are able to physically attend, 
their vibrations match those of each of the other participants in the room perfectly. Even though the majority of my synchronization workshops take the shape of questions and answers, they are above all, collect all a collective healing experience. I have people raise their hands if they have a question, as if they were in grade school all over again. The energy around the person whose question most closely matches the collective subconscious of the group will light up visually as if a light source is being projected through his or her aura. I call them to the stage and they sit, whoops, and they sit opposite, opposite me so they can ask their questions in front of the crowd. We get feedback and these workshops are raw and authentic. In them, I have created a way for men and women who feel isolated in their beliefs and struggles to come together with each other and to unite with a group of people who accepts and welcomes them as they are. They find out that they are not only acceptable, but also lovable, even with their shadowy aspects in tow. I may be the reason they have all come together, but like any facilitator, I am just enabling something much bigger than myself to take place. As I mentioned, at these synchronization workshops, everyone in the room is a, vib is a vibrational match to one another. Therefore, anything that I say to the person with me applies to the rest of the audience as well. As I lead the person sitting as I lead the person sitting with me through the microcosm of their own predicament into a state of awareness and improvement, the macrocosm experience experiences the same awareness and improvement, which serves as a mass healing for everyone there. The vibration within the room increases each time a new participant steps up on stage. So that is the end of chapter five. So that did a very good job at sort of uh, giving you a peek into her synchronization workshops, which I used to actually watch a lot of these. So, um, yeah, I mean, she kind of hit it, hit the hit the nail on the head there about what they basically are. They're sort of just like very large Q&A sessions. Um, where people ask literally anything and everything and um, uh, yeah that's kind of how she chooses her uh, how she chooses people that go on stage um, usually she ch checks out her, the energy field and uh, you know if she feels like uh, it's if the question is something that could apply to everybody there she usually chooses the person and um, that person goes up and asks their question and then sort of like a group collective healing takes place and um yeah, it's a it's actually very interesting. If you haven't seen any of her synchronization workshops yet, I would definitely recommend checking uh, checking some of those out. I know there's a few. There's actually a lot of them up on YouTube, um, and you can also watch them live as they happen via live stream if you subscribe to her um, her website or her premium program that she has, so you're able to watch them live. Um, but no, it's it's not it's probably not what you're thinking. I'm pretty sure you're probably thinking that somebody comes up and like they close their eyes and hold hands and just like meditate and pray. It's nothing like that. It's actually very informative information and um honestly, I don't think I've watched a single synchronization workshop where the message or advice or information that she gives uh following a question, I don't think I've watched a single video where uh her her receiving information hasn't resonated with me. I don't, I don't, I honestly don't think I have. And, um, <laughs> that's, that, that's a huge thing for me personally, because, you know, whenever I hear advice or information or, you know, tips and tricks, like there's certain things that I agree with and then there's certain things that I don't, I'm always sort of like in between, but for a lot of the things that she says and a lot of her advice and information, it's always, it's always spot on. Um, which is another reason why, you know, uh, this is probably why Teal in general is one of the, I guess you say, one of the teachers that I've always uh, followed throughout the years. Um, even now, I don't want, uh, even now, I don't really like watch her stuff that closely as much as I used to. Um, I kind of just do it whenever. Um, but even still, like, I still enjoy her information. I enjoy her community. And uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a pretty good peek into um, how the synchronization workshops go and sort of what she's doing now to be very honest with you um, so yeah it seems like the next chapter will go into uh, 
looks like the next chapter is a little bit more advice based and uh, it's a short one um, yeah it's a very short chapter so chapter six is pretty short so I will try and get chapter six out tomorrow um, so whenever you're seeing this video well whenever this is uploaded the following day I think chapter six I should be able to get it out by then so that's what I'm gonna aim for because we gotta we gotta make sure we hit that three a week quota at the very least if, if um, if uh if we want to get through this and like i said i don't really want to rush but i am behind and i haven't been doing these so i kind of want to get back up to speed so i feel like i should probably make up for my lost time too so all right hopefully you guys enjoyed that chapter if you did uh let me know what you think in the comments below let me know if you have any questions uh any suggestions and uh yeah i'll definitely check those out but uh if you haven't subscribed yet please be sure to subscribe hit that bell so you are kept up to date on when the next chapter video is uploaded and until next time you guys take care see ya